Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for, I guess, waking up on a Friday morning. I know it's 10 o'clock, but I'm still waking up as well. My flight got in at around 11 p.m., so uh, kind of a time difference thing. So as what was introduced, my name is Dr. Chris Peterson, and today I'll actually be talking about uh, spacecraft problems as it relates to decision, guidance, navigation, and control. So really this talk is going to be aimed at explaining to you what AFRL is, the sort of problems that we look at, and then I'll scope it down to where I work at, which is called Space Vehicles Directorate, and then talk about the problems that they look at, and then going down the rabbit hole and showing you some of the research that my group looks at, and then what I look at. And I plan to leave plenty of time for questions, so if you have them, don't worry. I'm not going to leave five minutes. I'll probably leave about 10 or 15 at the end. So to begin this talk, let me give you a little bit perspective on the sort of research problems and where they actually came from. And this really all stems from the space age in the early, mid 20th century. So to give you some perspective, at this point in time, at around 1969, there were about 1,500 space objects. Uh, two nations that went to the moon and about seven nations in space. And primarily, this sort of space research was stemming from the fact of government, kind of government-based. The United States was trying to get to the moon, so was the Russians, and so really, that was the main focus. So the problems at this point were, how do I get something to orbit the Earth? How do I get something to the moon? And that was pretty much the entire scope of that problem. Now, fast forward to what we're looking at today. And space research is really pushed from another direction, really the commercial direction. You look at companies such as SpaceX, which is looking at reusable rockets. You look at companies such as OneWeb and Amazon that really hope to put out hundreds, if not thousands, of satellites into Earth's orbit. And so that contains a very complex problem in general of how do you make sure that those satellites a, are in orbit appropriately, acting appropriately, and really don't collide into one another. Because although space is big, it really is not that big. And there have been collisions in space before that cause debris. I'll get into that a little later. So the problem has expanded, at least in Earth's orbit, to not only how do I orbit in space around the Earth, but how do I maneuver safely, efficiently, and basically cooperatively with other satellites. In addition, you know, looking right now, we now have 20,000, approximately, objects in space with multiple nations uh, in space and seven to the moon at this point. So now, problems consist of not only can I get to the moon, can I orbit the moon, what can I see on the moon, and beyond. So these are the sorts of problems which have started to increase in complexity as we start looking at the research as it pertains to space. And really, that's what these quotes exemplify. You don't have to read them all in depth. But from a variety of different standpoints, really you hear that space is the next frontier. So what are the sorts of problems that we want to look at as it pertains to space? And so what we look at at AFRL is really those sorts of problems of being able to maneuver things safely and efficiently and reliably. So that's what I'll be talking about today. So just to give you a little bit of introduction into what AFRL is and what Space Vehicles Director it is. So AFRL is not just based in New Mexico. It is a whole system comprising of around 9 to 11 scientific directorates, which each directorate focuses on a particular topic. So our headquarters here is in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio. And there is about four or five different directorates. One that focuses exclusively on sensors, one that focuses exclusively on planes and aerospace systems. We also have some in Florida, that's called munitions directorate. They look exclusively at UAVs and missiles. In New Mexico, where I'm based, we have two directorates. We have space vehicles, as well as directed energy, which stands for pretty much lasers at that point in time. And then for the poor people who are stationed in Maui, that's also kind of where they focus on lasers as well as space situational awareness, looking at the sky. So as what was mentioned, I am based in New Mexico. And 
to put it in perspective, most of you have heard of NASA, if not everyone. And NASA is typically thought of the research arm for space. But what should be actually known is that the Air Force is the research arm for the DOD as it pertains to spacecraft research. And so we focus on research as it pertains to how can we aid the warfighter, but also look at some of the more abstract research as well. So NASA doesn't necessarily have a monopoly on that sort of thing for the US government. All right, you might have seen this slide before. Uh, this is kind of my nice introduction to uh, what you guys think I do. So, what my mom thinks I do. She thinks I'm a mad scientist, which is not necessarily false. Uh, for some of the projects that we look at, we have to think outside the box. We have to look at those next step ideas. We have to look at not hey, this has worked now, let's just continue using it. Let's think of the more complex optimizations. Let's look at the more complex maneuvering or the more complex sensors that are required in space. So that's really not necessarily false, but not necessarily true. Next up, what my friends think I do, they think I'm an astronaut, uh, which is completely wrong because I am deathly afraid of heights, so that would not work. But in this sort of sense, really a lot of what that picture represents is not necessarily false as well. So we actually look at human interactions, how humans interact in space with space vehicles, because we command a lot of them from the ground. So how do we efficiently maneuver them, communicate with them, repair them in space if they do get damaged? So again, not necessarily false, but not necessarily true. What society thinks I do? Anyone want to have a guess here? Aliens. <laughs> New Mexico, Roswell. Where as, well, you know, I do technically work for Area 52. That does say it on my, my little government ID. But, yeah, well, I can't say anything about aliens, so I'll let your minds wander on that point right there. What my boss thinks I do, build massive ships, look at Death Stars. And really, that's not necessarily false as well. We look at technology that helps enable us to keep at the forefront of basically spacecraft technology. And so while, yes, this is a big weapon essentially in space, uh, we still strive to look at the next generation technology. What I think I do. I think I do simulations. As much as I'd like to think that I build satellites or you know, float up in space, really a lot of the fundamental work that I do looks at creating algorithms, creating those sorts of methodologies by which we can utilize in space. And so from that certain perspective, we do have to do simulation environments. We do have to look at how things work at a basic level, and then we can transition it to actual space vehicles. But what I really do, I give PowerPoints, I make PowerPoints. But this is important as well because this allows me to forecast sort of my research to you. It allows me to explain what I do and in turn it allows me to collaborate with other people as well. So again, that's actually a very useful job although it consumes a lot more than what I wish it would. <clears throat> so going down kind of the rabbit hole here. So I talked about space vehicles, and that's where I work. And technically, the more letters in front of your name is the lower down on the totem pole you are. So space vehicles is RV. RVS is really the spacecraft technologies component. And then on that is RVSV, which is really the group that looks at what we call pervasive technologies. Now this might look a little bit daunting and a little bit kind of condensed, but really the technologies that we start to look at are things such as space solar power, space system resilience, space logistics. And while this really has a lot of applied sort of connotation to it, really all of this is not possible without the fundamental research that's performed by various groups, universities, and people at AFRL. <clears throat> 
So for instance, space solar power. These sorts of problems look at putting up large solar panels into space. But those solar panels are flexible. So that goes back to controlling large flexible bodies in space efficiently and reliably. And not only that, but looking at power management. How do the power dynamics actually influence your control? We look at space system resilience. How, can my, how do I improve my spacecraft actually being efficient and living long in space? So how do I improve <coughs> agi agility and maneuverability? That's an optimization problem or an optimal control problem at that point in time. Survivability, high performance of small sets, that all goes down to optimal control and the research that's fundamentally done there. Space logistics. We have problems that look at what we call rendezvous and proximity operations. Those problems where satellites basically orbit one another within ranges of kilometers and look at docking. But those sorts of problems involve contact mechanics. I'll go into that a little later. Or soft robotics. I'll actually show a picture of this later, but that's an infinite dimensional problem. So all of this is really what I'm telling you are these applied aspects really can stem and really are expanded through theoretical research that maybe you guys are looking at right now. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. So we say adversary action. There's adversary action in space. So I don't really like that terminology, but uh, it's basically a way of discussing at how different satellites act with one another. So an adversary in that sort of sense is really looking at when you have a formation of satellites, but maybe one of them is malfunctioned. And so it acts in an adversarial role to the rest of its formation. So not in the adversary sense that you would think it is, but in this sort of sense, it's not aiding the formation that it's actually looking at. Feel free to stop me with questions if people do. But a kind of a couple of the more specific problems that we're looking at. Uh, one of which is called on-orbit servicing. So one common phrase that's kind of said through my community are there are no gas stations in space. When you toss up a satellite, it only has a limited amount of fuel. And once it runs out of fuel, <clears throat> you pretty much put it into what we call a garbage orbit and it stays there for its entire life or until it burns out. Well, if we have the capability in order to resurface those satellites, we extend the life and the scientific capability behind that. But those sorts of problems are really nice because, again, we look at contact mechanics. How, do we, how are we able to safely and efficiently rendezvous and fuel up our assets? Another one is called in-space assembly. So it takes money and it takes resource to build a satellite and then toss it into space. And the heavier the object, the more cost it is. So if we can assemble things in space, then it becomes a little bit cheaper for us. And we can become a little bit what we call resilient. And if a satellite breaks in space, we'll be able to service it and maybe repair it. So uh, that experiment is actually being looked at by NASA right now. Another one that's a nice little one is called debris mitigation. You remember that previous slide that I had put up there that had 20,000 objects in space. And it's only going to increase with the number of satellites that are going to be put up there by SpaceX, OneWeb. So how do we unclutter our environment so that we don't get collisions? Because on average, a satellite's going to have to perform a collision avoidance maneuver. And that's going to cost fuel. So if we're able to take away some of the debris, then we're able to maneuver in space more easily. Uh, this last project I'm not going to really talk about, but it goes more towards the rapid development of maybe the CubeSats, which you guys have, might have heard of, those small satellites that really can be sent up into space rather cheaply. But uh, what sort of guidance navigation talk would it be if I didn't put up a block diagram here? And so let me now talk about kind of the specifics of that I look at, which is called the guidance, navigation, and control problem. And so for a single vehicle, a single satellite, the problem is pretty well understood. We have that block up there that says dynamics, really how our spacecraft evolves with time. On either end, we have the actuators and the sensors, which really dictate how my satellite moves 
and how it senses the environment. And so for a single satellite, they're pretty simple mechanisms. They're what we call reaction wheels to help it point, thrusters to help it move, sensors as such as what we call a star tracker to look at stars and to tell how it's pointing. But taking that information and using it for single satellites, that's a problem that AFRL has looked at quite well and has understood quite well. Looking at inertial navigation, because really, in contrast to maybe a UAV where you could just look out and see it, spacecraft, that's not necessarily the case. We don't, our telescopes will only see dots in space. So we have to gain some sort of knowledge about where we are. Ground guidance. For single satellites, typically how they maneuver in space is just someone plots a trajectory on the ground and uploads it to the vehicle. And then finally, control. How do I actually do maneuvering or how do I actually control my reaction wheels? That's most commonly a PID control. And so at least for the single vehicle case, AFRL well understands this problem. Uh, some simple examples of what we've looked at, uh, the satellites are called XSS-11 and DSX. Those are some current and past missions where this problem we have actually strived to understand. But my upper management likes to say that GNC is a solved problem for satellites. But that's not necessarily the case because the problem consistently changes. For example, now we take a step further, <coughs> excuse me, and look at what we call the RPO problem or the rendezvous and proximity operation problem. So in this case, how do satellites interact with one another? How can they dock with one another? How do they do that efficiently and safely? And so in this case, we still have our nominal dynamics, but we need more sensors. We need things such as cameras, LIDAR, in order to actually sense relatively where the satellites are with respect to one another. We need new navigation algorithms to encompass that information in order to translate that to other onboard processes. Because the satellites might be orbiting within close proximity with one another, we need to be able to generate trajectories on board. We can't wait for the ground to actually do that. And furthermore, we need precise control. PID might not work in this case. If you're going to dock, you don't want to be 10 degrees off or else you're going to collide your satellites and wreck maybe two millions worth of dollars in government funds. So in this case, the problem fundamentally changes. And again, AFRL is striving to at least understand this technology and is actually leading this field with two of our current missions. Uh, a past one is actually ANGELS and one that's currently in orbit called Eagle Mycroft. So again, we've understood this problem, but then our management says, well, the GNC problem is solved. So what is there left to do? Well, then we step into the multi-agent realm and the problem shifts again. We need more sensors. We need better actuators. We need better coordinated ground guidance on board. All these sorts of things that really stem from the research that's being performed at AFRL and in collaboration with our partners, including universities. And so really, these sorts of problems are now what's facing us. How do satellites interact with one another? How do they coordinate their information with one another? How are they able to make decisions without colliding into one another? These sorts of problems, which are really uh, becoming at the forefront of what we need. So yeah. How far away do you think So uh, they could be anywhere. I would say we look at problems anywhere between kilometers between one another to maybe uh, megameters, which is a thousand kilometers. So they can be either far apart or very close together. So each sort of different. Uh, range constitutes a different sort of problem or a different scientific objective in that sort of case. So when they're close in, you might want to do something like an inspection of something. So you don't want them to collide with one another. But if they're far apart, then the problem becomes of how do they communicate efficiently with one another? Does that answer your question? So going forward, my group because they keep on saying GNC is a solved problem, we've re we have rebranded ourselves. And we call ourselves the Rangers Program, which stands for Resilient Autonomous Navigation <coughs> Guidance Robotics and Swarms Program. I was not the one who came up with this, nor do I have any sort of 
sway in that decision, but I still like the name. Now, but you'll notice here on this Venn diagram that we still have advanced navigation and estimation and autonomous guidance and control. So those two are our fundamental building blocks for our program. Now, I'll look at these a little bit later. But then, since the problem has shifted, we start looking at autonomy. We start looking at multi-agent work. And then we start looking at robotics and logistics. And one thing to note here is that these problems that we look at aren't necessarily separate. They're shared amongst all the different program groups, but also fundamentally support our missions. Those satellites that I showed you, DSX, Eagle Mycroft, Angels, all of our research goes towards supporting those missions and being able to efficiently and safely maneuver those satellites. So let me just kind of break down a little of these pro projects that we're looking at, and then I'll start diving deeper down. So autonomous guidance and control. This is my forte. And these sorts of problems that I start to look at are how do I maneuver a satellite safely and efficiently? So looking at things, people like to say, let's do recursive optimization. Because in a space environment, as much as we'd like to say we know the dynamics, uh, in the words of George Box, all models are wrong. There's always going to be something not modeled, no matter how small, no matter how large. And so how are we able to rapidly adapt to that environment? How are we able to actually uh, deal with that changing environment to efficiently and safely move? Kind of that video that you see up there in the right-hand corner of these two large Death Stars actually moving, and yet we're actually able to get to the origin or get to that green dot safely. Now, that involves a complex optimization process. And nowadays, you hear things like AI, machine learning. While useful tools on the ground, they require lots of computational processes. They require lots of memory. So a lot of this program searches to make sure that that computational load is minimized, not only in terms of runtime, but also memory. As much as I would like to say that GNC should be the pinnacle of every single satellite, that's not the case. We are relegated to maybe 10% of computational, computational resources, while the other 90% is towards science, essentially. And looking at these optimizations, they're not necessarily, uh, how would I say, standard. There exist problems where the cost function might be what we call non-smooth, non-continuous. Uh, degenerate, where there exists infinite solutions. So your common nonlinear solvers, your Fmin con is not going to solve those problems easily. And so how do we develop techniques by which to solve that problem? And furthermore, can it solve that problem? Because if you toss into a problem or give a nonlinear optimization a problem, it's not necessarily guaranteed to find a solution. And if it tosses out maybe NANs at my satellite, What's it supposed to do at that point? It might go into a tumble. It might just stop operating in general. So how am I able to increase the reliability behind that sort of process? And that goes to the second point, which is called validation, verification, and assessment for complex systems. So you see this platform here to the lower left. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But if you remember from that previous slide, you said I, I said I did simulations. Well, now it's taking those simulations and making sure that they, that interacts with the entire system, the command and decision making, and the estimator appropriately, so that they're all interacting in tandem and completing one goal. Going on to the next problem, space robotics. So it might be as you think it is, sticking a robotic arm on a satellite in order to rendezvous and dock. And that's sort of the problem that we start to look at. So these sorts of problems look at the on-orbit servicing, like I talked about before with her store L. That's, uh, I believe, NASA's mission at this point. And really, the robotic arm is an interesting problem. Because while we think we can grapple things on Earth, the contact mechanics in space are slightly different and unknown. So how do we actually model those? How do we exploit those? instead of maybe doing something like a linear feedback where we get rid of all the terms we don't want 
and we make the system the way that we do want. While that's nice in practice, we need to make sure that we allocate the correct amount of fuel and efficiency towards the problem. The soft robotics is an interesting problem, as you see here, grappling a ball, is that comes from the fact that if I want to dock with a satellite that's rotating, if I have a rigid arm and it attaches to something rotating, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to snap. <laughs> it's going to break. And so we don't want that necessarily to happen. So that's where the soft robotics comes in, and that's an infinite dimensional system. So how do I control that efficiently? Uh, modular hardware and software. Basically, how do I create plug and play? That enables our technology to be rapidly deployed. I'll talk about this rock lab a little bit later, but that is a seven degree of freedom arm, and that also helps our verification and validation process. Multi-agent and collaborative autonomy. Again, I'm giving you a snapshot of the problems that we actually look at so that if again, you guys are interested, then there's something here to kind of discuss and talk about. In this case, we now start looking at how do satellites interact with one another, which was alluded to already. How do they make reliable decisions so that they don't crash into one another? How do they have efficient resource management? Can they balance fuel? Can they look at power optimization, thermal net optimization? And if they fail, can they recover? That's a big part. Uh, as much as we hate to admit it, satellites fail on orbit. How many of you guys have heard of the Kepler telescope? Anyone? A couple people. Uh, for those who don't know, Kepler was a satellite that had what we call four reaction wheels, so it could control its attitude appropriately. It lost two of them. And so then Kepler wasn't able to point efficiently at stars. And so it, its mission was pretty much scrapped until a way was developed to utilize the underlying dynamics to recover that mission. That's one example. I can give you about five other satellites that have failed in orbit. DART was one of them, and it basically had problems with deploying its drag panels. There were two other satellites that lost reaction wheels. So as much as we think that our satellites will function appropriately in space, they will not. And we have to figure out ways in order to compensate for those failures. Yeah. Does that affect your design phase? I mean, when you design, you design so that if a fault occurs, there's visibility, or you just design it for other consideration, then once things break, then you look for ways to fix it. So kind of half and half at that point. Okay. So with Kepler, they added a fourth reaction wheel in hopes that if one failed, that the other three would actually compensate. In that case, then two of them failed, and they were up the creek without a paddle. Now, it's hard to do that design space because unlike other, space, unlike other vehicles, we have limited size, weight, and power. And each little bit of mass that's put onto a spacecraft costs a tremendous amount of resource. And so a lot of the techniques that we're starting to look at is how can we design software to compensate for failures? Because if you start looking at maybe the attitude problem, Two reaction wheels is sufficient to control a attitude of a satellite. Or maybe you don't need all your thrusters. You can just deal with one of them. So that's how we start looking at problems is not necessarily adding redundancy because that adds uh, size, weight, and power, but how can we utilize our current resources to save uh, the mission is what it is. Uh, it is taken into consideration in the design phase, but you can't catch everything, unfortunately. I think other things to kind of talk about this one is you might have heard of swarms, or basically tons of satellites in space. So how do we coordinate them? How, do we, how are we able to actually utilize them to complete a mission, especially if communication is delayed? Or if, what was alluded to before, a satellite fails in the formation. So how do we actually adapt to that sort of failure? And then we have something called SSA, which stands for Space Situational Awareness. How can I use those satellites to look at various objects? And how does information shared across all of them? That looks at underlying communication topology, information sharing, navigation algorithms, which then goes to this fourth kind of objective here, which is relative navigation and estimation. So how am I able to extract that sort of information and utilize it 
for my purposes. So for instance, uh, one of the bullets here looks at modeling forces, modeling dynamics. Uh, we have very simple dynamics that we utilize for spacecraft maneuvering. They're called HCW dynamics. They're linear, which makes things nice for control design. But in these equations, they're actually unobservable parts, unobservable modes. So if we start actually modeling more and more effects, can we utilize those nonlinearities in order to exploit them instead of just neglecting them? And furthermore, parameter estimation and system ID. That's the other kind of part of this sort of portion, is in satellites, while we think we mount things in the appropriate direction, uh, it gets onto orbit and then we realize, well, something in the design documentation is off. Maybe a sensor is pointed away by about 10 or 20 degrees and it wasn't supposed to. So then how are we able to understand this sort of information that's coming out and fix it or actually utilize it? Uh, one of the other things that I'll just point out in this, in this problem is information. As opposed to a UAV, uh, the information in space is not as diverse as what you would expect it to be. A geostationary orbit takes 24 hours to complete. And so the diversity in about an hour of measurements at geostationary is not that much. So you can't recover your orbit from that. So then a problem becomes is, how can I do my decision making with limited information. Again, I talked about these four pinnacles, but now I'm just gonna spend maybe a couple minutes on kind of the research that I look at, and then I'll actually talk about labs, kind of our fun toys that we have. That makes us a little bit more different than some of the other research facilities. So a lot of what I tend to look at is what's called predictive control. So maybe some of you have seen this diagram Predictive control is essentially looking over a finite window, optimizing over some sort of metric, maybe fuel, maybe time, and then coming up with a set of discrete inputs and executing that trajectory. But we only execute the first step and then slip the horizon by one, rinse and repeat, which gives us what we call an ever-evolving optimal path. So for example, if you look at that figure to the left, we have an initial location. We want to get to the star. And we plan a path, it's fairly straight, but at its first time instance, because of those unmodeled dynamics that we might not have taken into consideration, we move off it. Well, instead of executing the entire open loop trajectory, we re-optimize and we get a newer path. And we continue this process, maybe an obstacle comes in the way, and by doing this over and over, get an efficient path. So this is sometimes referred to as receding horizon control, model predictive control, and the benefits are it's systematic. It's, you have a cost function, you minimize it subject to constraints, which is important to me because I want my spacecraft to be safe. And that's really kind of the big key. And furthermore, well I guess that's it. These three bullets kind of encompass what I just said in two, so I won't bore you with that. But I think one of the things that I want to touch on is the following, is you might have heard of convex optimization. And that is a very nice tool in order to basically get solutions to highly nonlinear problems. But with convexification, essentially you take the problem and you reformulate it. And maybe at the end of the day, you don't quite optimize your total metric that you were expecting. So for example, you might want to minimize with respect to fuel and some trajectory error. But through convexification, the constraints might not reflect exactly what you wanted to in the first place. So what we're actually starting to look at is nonlinear optimization techniques because those tools are becoming more and more robust. And in fact, we're able to exploit nonlinearities in the system using the nonlinear model. So for example, I talked about Kepler. On the left-hand side, we can actually see how a nonlinear optimizer picks an efficient trajectory. So for the attitude of a spacecraft, if that pink line there doesn't have any direct control input, and yet the green and blue do, the optimizer actually says perform a periodic motion in order to efficiently guide our underactuated satellite to the origin. And that actually 
creates a discontinuous control law, something that linear problems will not produce. And so these sorts of problems which really start exploiting the nonlinearities are what we're actually looking for. But, as I said before, nonlinear programming is a little bit complex and can be unreliable. So some of the stuff that I've started to look at is what's called feasible predictive control. So I not only look at the underlying, uh, underlying concept of the problem, I start looking at the underlying dynamics of the solver itself. Because for general nonlinear problems, the solver might stop, start with an infeasible solution and try to refine it to a feasible solution. But it might not converge. In which case, again, you get to the point of a NAND solution, and then your satellite starts to execute something that it doesn't want to execute. So in this case, uh, what we started looking at are solvers by which we are able to take a feasible solution and maintain its feasibility. So if you have to cut it off, you're actually able to still execute the current solution and retain some amount of stability, retain some amount of feasibility. And while this can take a little bit longer to converge to the true optimal, I'll take feasibility over optimality any day. If I have to use fuel to get out of the way of an object, I will use that fuel to get out of the way of an object. <laughs> so in kind of this sort of uh, kind of framework here, one of the things that we've come up with or we have kind of added upon previous literature is feasible predictive control, where you're able to take a feasible path and refine it. But what's really nice is that after a certain amount of time, you actually converge to the optimal solution after a while. And so while it might take longer to get your efficiency, you actually reduce computation by, uh, I guess I can't even read those numbers right there, but in any case, you can reduce computation by a significant amount. And it comes only at the cost of a little bit of efficiency. Again, if I'm looking for a response, that's really what I want. But I'm going to finish up with labs right now because I think I'm running out of time and I want to leave some time for questions. So one of the things that makes our kind of lab unique are its cool toys. So our first lab is called CANS, which stands for Collaborative Autonomous Network Systems Lab. It's a very uh, simplistic lab that has uh, three-wheeled non-holonomic robots, and they basically emulate spacecraft motion on a floor. Now, what makes them unique is not the robotics, but really the computational ability of them. Because there are no MacBooks on in space, technology is about 10 years, if not greater, in space than it is here on Earth. And so we have processors that are very representative to that hardware. And so in this case, we're able to actually test things like formation flight algorithms, communication algorithms, on a test bed by which accurately represents the hardware, or at least the soft hardware capability processors. We don't have thrusters on these little robots. That would be a little bit dangerous. But it enables us to also look at the whole uh, command decision estimation navigation process, as all of those algorithms are interacting together. The second lab we have, which was alluded to, is called a ROC, which stands for Robotic Orbital Control Laboratory. This lab has a 14 foot by 14 foot, 66,000 ton granite slab. And this slab is flat to, I believe, one one hundredth of an inch. And so this allows us to actually start looking at uh, near frictionless sorts of maneuvers because these robots have air bearings on them. So compressed air will push up from them and start actually, you can push them with a finger and they'll just glide like a hockey puck. So in this case, uh, this lab is really meant for close proximity operational vehicle testing. So you can see these two videos right here that if the air bearings aren't on, the robotic arm grapples the cube quite nicely. But in space, you have to consider angular momentum conservation. So you can see that the arm fails to do that because it has to take into consideration angular momentum. And so really, this lab has a couple of objectives too because that arm is a seven degree of freedom uh, arm. There exists an infinite amount of solutions to rotate 
twist that arm and still obtain that block. So how do you efficiently maneuver that platform and the arm to rendezvous efficiently? And then as I said before, really this has to deal with contact mechanics. Once it grapples that cube, what happens then? And then the final lab here is called Rebel. It's the Resilient Bus Experimental Laboratory Facility. And this is a four ton, three degree of freedom air bearing, which if you can see that video on the left hand side, underneath that platform is a ball of compressed air. And so while four tons, you can actually press that with a finger and it will rotate. And so this facility allows us to start testing our autonomous navigation, our autonomous guidance, decision making, and puts it all into the loop with hardware and software that is flight representative. And so this enables us to look at advanced algorithms like our predictive controllers or some of the other stuff that we look at and apply it and see how it performs. Now, as you see this platform kind of rotate, it actually will hold these attitudes within about a degree of error, if not less. And you can't really see it at this point, but there are six what we call CMGs that actually actuate this platform. And it enables us to start looking at hardware in the loop testing. And I'll say this is while this platform enables us to test these individual algorithms, it's more so in the sense to see how the entire system actually functions appropriately. But we couldn't have done this all by ourselves. Partnerships and collaborations is what I kind of want to end with here. Those labs that you saw really came from the hard work of not us at AFRL, but a lot of our faculty collaborations, as well as a lot of our student interns. Uh, for example, CANS and Rebel I worked on as an intern when I was there. And so one of the ways that we are able to advance the way that we look at things is through these collaborations. And so you know, this is me putting my plug here for if anyone is interested. Uh, there are numerous opportunities here. Uh, one is the AFRL Scholars Program, which is our summer program, which really enables students to work on these sorts of platforms, work on research that you might be working on theoretically here, but then can apply to an actual function at the base. Uh, we also have visiting faculty that tend to come to the base as well during those summers. Uh, sometimes they spend a couple months, sometimes we have faculty come for a day or two. And furthermore, we also have postdoc positions as well. So if anyone is interested in those, uh, the, my email is up there and I'm more than happy to respond to that. But more so, I kind of want to point to the fact of a lot of the algorithms and stuff that we do actually have basis in our university collaborations as well. Uh, I will say, because it is the US government, uh, it is restricted to US citizens, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes dual citizens if uh, they are appropriate. But uh, in any case, that's uh, really, I can't say enough on how much we actually start pushing the boundaries of research with our collaborators. And at that point, I do want to end and take any questions at this point.